Sydney architect Harry Seidler was appointed visiting professor in architecture at the University of New South Wales for the first semester of 1980. He was born in Vienna in 1923. After studies in England, he graduated from the University of Manitoba in Canada. Later, he did postgraduate work at Harvard University under the founder of the Bauhaus, Walter Gropius, and studied design under the painter, Josef Albers. In 1948, Seidler started to practice in Sydney, and the many buildings he has completed since then have earned him an international reputation. Amongst his best known buildings are Sydney's Blues Point Tower, Australia Square and the MLC Centre, and Canberra's Trade Group offices. A recent overseas work is the Australian Embassy in Paris. This lecture deals with Seidler's extensive experience in designing housing, involving not only the detailed architectural aspects, but also town planning issues. Australia has to its credit some fine examples of domestic architecture, but largely those that date back almost 100 years. At that time, in our colonial period, we find architecture built for people to live in, full of imagination, full of ingenuity, and even taste. Now, much of this continued throughout the 19th century. But unfortunately today, I don't think one can claim this to still be so. Domestic architecture at, in the 20th century, or through most of it, is, I'm afraid, painfully provincial here. Now, there are, of course, great movements of new architecture that have taken place in other Western countries. And what we hear of them on this side of the world is little more than a faint echo. And it probably is not surprising that due to our geographic isolation, that things tend to remain either misunderstood or interpreted in such a way as to yield results that by and large, must be termed provincial. They miss the essentials. They miss the real point. For that reason, I believe it is important to reiterate some of the creative origins and where and what are the principles of modern architecture, where do they have their roots, and where are they going? And above all, where should we go? Now, when we look at the earliest of sketches uh, of this one, um, uh, of Le Corbusier's work, we find an establishment in simple terms of a principle that simply says, in this day and age, we have different materials to those that were used in the past. We have materials that make it possible to hold up houses, or for that matter, buildings, on columns on frames rather than on walls, which gives us a new freedom, a new flexibility. And the freedom Corbusier envisaged to be manifold. His innumerable sketches of concepts for houses dating back to the early 1920s show us this vision of this new freedom that he was portraying as the potential and the aim, the visual aim, of modern architecture. Houses uh, such as this one, uh, built in 1926, Villa La Roche in Paris, shows wide openings to the outside. It shows visual or uh, spatial penetrations, openings into other levels through here, stairs flying up quite uninterrupted without the constriction of surrounding walls. Other uh, concepts here show the, 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 the virtual fusion that exists between inside and outside. And others portray the same flexibility and newness of spatial concepts uh, that had come to architecture. And this goes back a long way. It's important for us to appreciate that and remember just what the outcomes of this were in comparison to the kind of thing that was always considered the sine qua non of domestic architecture. Corbusier was a great 
spokesman for the new principles, the new opportunities, by making sketches of this kind, pointing out uh, on, on, on one side the, the, the restriction, the paralysis of, a, of an, of an old-fashioned building that relies on its walls to carry the weight and the minimal windows that uh, were possible, as against the new freedom of a free plan, as he calls it, uh, carried by minimal members of support. Uh, area gained by raising such a building above the ground. Uh, he claims, of course, to be uh, far more desirable than the, the earthbound equivalent of bygone times. Now, these have become very, very uh, well known and, 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 and comparable commodities. But one thing I think must be remembered, and some of his early lessons in being a great spokesman for uh, the principles of modern architecture. Uh, is something that has tended to become diluted with time and never has really fully penetrated, especially the Australian scene. And that's this very simple sketch comparing the fundamentals of a simple building in terms of its window openings. Now he compares and points out that uh, a traditional building uh, with its inevitable structural resulting um, uh, structurally determined, really, vertical openings, uh, these two windows uh, don't produce a very good light distribution inside. Uh, he calls it zone four at the end of a room that is lit by two such windows, in addition to which, he says, around this window will be a very glary surface, so there will be great glare between the darkness of this wall, which is seen in silhouette against the brightness of this open window. Instead, he says, let's take these two windows and turn them on their side, put them horizontally in the wall so as to go from one side to the other. And you will get a far better light distribution in the room. You will get less glare. And of course, this is the kind of horizontal window that is made possible by modern structural devices. It's a very basic lesson, which is he proceeded to translate into his well-known early houses, which have now become the monuments of modern architecture. This one, in fact, Villa Savoy at, uh, at Poissy, outside of Paris, uh, is now a national monument. People can just go there and marvel at this uh, quite astonishing work dating back to 1929. And there are a score of such houses that Le Corbusier built. This is uh, a fragment of Maison Cook built in uh, Paris showing that very distribution uh, of windows, which is very commonplace with our, uh, to our eyes in the latter part of the 20th century now. But I think it's important to remember that lesson, that there are good reasons, not only stylistic ones, to have such a disposition of openings. Uh, I have found that people tend to forget this. Now let's, let's look at uh, uh, some of the famous houses that employ to varying degrees and in different ways, uh, these modern principles. This Villa Garche, again by Le Corbusier, dating back to 1926, it would be, I'm sure, as modern as anything we can envisage today. It certainly utilizes all these principles, the structural freedom, the horizontal distribution of openings, the great uh, spatial playfulness, both external and internal. One can look right through the building. There's light coming through the solidity of it here the lightness that uh, I've mentioned uh, on another occasion to be emanating as much from the architect's uh, input uh, as much as by the, the painters and sculptors tendencies in our time. But this is a modern building which I don't believe has lost any of its modernity in spite of uh, having existed for over half a century. On a very different theme, the American architect Frank Lloyd Wright has produced some uh, buildings that I think uh, have gone down in history as really milestones of development in this sphere. This building, a uh, Kaufman House near Pittsburgh, built in 1936, is a unique building in this way that um, it is not typically American, historians have found, um, in that it's hovering planes, planes that uh, are vertical as much as they are horizontal. We have vertical slabs. We have hovering planes that seem to have no support at all, um, juxtaposed vertically above each other, above these magnificent 
waterfall, uh, that this really comes and can be compared to the uh, painter's vision, such as the Dutch painter uh, Theo van Doesburg, uh, whose work I've shown on another occasion uh, with his image of uh, floating slabs in space. And again, this is the kind of thing made possible by modern technology, which has had its influence on the, uh, uh, the output and the concepts that architects have followed. This house is, of course, a romantic house. And it has had, uh, I mean, the very setting is just so enticing to, for a house to actually be built with a waterfall running under it. Um, a, 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 a very lovely uh, notion almost to anyone's uh, uh, eyes and, and, and ideas of uh, what an ideal place uh, it would be to live. Um, uh, this reflects the romantic, organic architecture, as Wright spoke of. Uh, and uh, it, it does, in other of his examples, uh, put buildings in far greater fusion with nature. Uh, this one I point to because it is so much more of in the language of modern architecture as it was being practiced uh, throughout the Western world, really, in subsequent years. It has had an influence in Australia on some architects. Uh, there are examples of uh, modern houses built uh, in Sydney, particularly in the 1950s and early 60s, maybe, that have a similar use of material aimed almost very literally to translate these ideas of Frank Lloyd Wright's into Australian terms. It was felt to be particularly suitable here, putting such houses uh, with these raw, rough materials of stone of uh, untreated natural uh, timbers into the natural Australian uh, bushland. In fact, the interiors uh, seem, uh, and this again is still the Kaufman House uh, by Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, and there are many examples of this kind uh, at that time in, in, in Sydney. Uh, um, it, it seems to be just tailor-made for our climate, for our um, em environment that was encountered in uh, outer suburbs, and it seemed to fit our way of uh, life very well. I think it's always dangerous to literally translate, but rather to take principles and translate them into genuinely our terms, not literally direct translations, but those that are muted by uh, the special circumstances that inevitably exist. Well, we'll see more of local work later, but let us just look again at some of the great form givers, the master builders, as they've been called of our time, uh, and what they did in the early days of the, uh, of the modern movement and the kind of modern domestic architecture which they produced. This is Walter Gropius building this house for himself in 1937 uh, outside of Boston. He became the head of the school at Harvard, uh, having come uh, from Germany via England. Uh, and he built this house, which spe obviously speaks the language of uh, uh, very much the Bauhaus uh, mode of design, as it's been uh, called. But it's an international architecture uh, that is very much related to the painter's notion of the simple outline, the simple form that has projections but, and that has recessions, the pieces hollowed out of this cube. Uh, they go into an area and form a partially covered space within. And that's characteristic of the sculptural concept of much architecture that came from that time. At the same uh, time, it also reflects something of its locale. New England in the United States uh, is a country uh, where uh, the timber house is the norm. The clapboard house had been built there ever since its colonial days going back to the 17th century. Simple, white-painted timber boards. And these are reused in this modern architecture, which, of course, structurally enjoys using timber framing, which is the comparable part to the early reinforced concrete or steel frame that Le Corbusier used in, the, in, in, in Europe. So it is very simple in such a rigid frame made out of uh, timber members to produce a horizontally disposed window, which would be very difficult to do if you had to pile bricks on top of this uh, uh, element of an opening that really removes all structural support. What is interesting is the fact that although this building is that cube, 
that it has suddenly a diagonal line diving into it, it seems. This entrance portico is at an angle to everything else. It's a, a, a sudden jar to the, to the, the, the totality, but the interesting thing is that it is recalled almost as counterpoint is in music on the interior with a comparably shaped internal wall dividing um, the living room from uh, uh, study and so on, which is a very prominent part of the interior. And this is very much within the language of modern architecture as I've discussed some of its visual principles uh, before. Uh, as much as this other view of that house, which shows uh, that sculptural concern about dissolution of, uh, of the solidity. You can look right through an opening in this uh, solid uh, element of a house, and there's a spiral stair quite sculpturally giving access to what is obviously a terrace, which we've seen from another side. So although appearing a, a simple cube, it is manipulated, it is hollowed out, projected, and recessed to give it that sculptural interest that uh, makes it part of the image of our time. Marcel Breuer was uh, in uh, uh, partnership with Gropius in the early days in, in the United States, built a lot of houses. Uh, he's uh, uh, produced some seminal examples and, and, and prototypes, really, which have uh, uh, had their consequences almost throughout the globe. Uh, this house, the second one he built for himself, not far from New York. I happen to have been involved in the house, having done all the working drawings for it in 1947, when it was built, uh, is a timber house, again, utilizing the rigidity of timber form, uh, timber boards, uh, which are evident in these diagonal lines that we can see, it, so that the wall itself is used as a truss to jut out over the shorter foundation. And similarly, on this side, the base stops here, but the top hangs out a long way uh, beyond it, getting the most for the least, the least amount of material and labor, get a maximum physical as well as visual result. But more importantly, Breuer is one that almost, as one would say, in a, in a Gordian knot kind of solution, found ways to solve the problems of the individual simple house. Here, a two-bedroom house. Uh, solved with such clarity and simplicity that it is quite um, uh, you know, amazing. So rarely do we see uh, houses planned so directly. Uh, the, the fact is that there is a desirable orientation and a nice open site. And the best orientation is simply used by putting all the rooms, the main bedroom, the secondary bedroom, the laundry work area where the woman spends a lot of her time, the kitchen, the dining room, the living room and its outdoor area, all facing the same desirable direction, equipped with a sun protection overhang so that it doesn't get too hot inside and the light is shielded. Whereas all the service areas and storage and so on on the off side, as is the corridor, as is the entrance. A very direct, simple procedure. And these direct and simple solutions to planning problems are the things that I feel are still lacking in Australian domestic architecture. It has never come to terms with giving absolutely straight line and clear answers to what appear to often be quite complex problems, but to reduce them down to a fundamental. This is a, a house built in 1948, it's the first house I actually built, but it uh, clarifies it, that on one side it is uh, desirable for various reasons to plan all the nighttime uses, all the bedrooms, are lined up in one row. They face the same way. They have within them their mechanical uh, plumbing core, the bathrooms, and so on. On the other side, parallel to it, is all the daytime activities. You've got the kitchen, it's laundry, dining, and living. And between them is a neutral zone that can be combined either with the children's uh, bedrooms to be used as a playroom, or when they're, when they're asleep, and uh, this is all shut off here, that area can be flexibly combined with the living area to help um, for adult entertainment. So these are the kind of uh, simple steps to analyze uh, what is really needed in the family, and you solve them very simply and in a very straightforward way, inevitably in a way that, of course, reflects also the taste, the, the, the sculptural impetus, the visual aims that the architect has. And this particular house, although 
as I say, it's built in, in, in Australia, it very much leans on the visual language of the, of the kind of architecture that uh, Gropius and Breuer practice in the eastern United States, having transported or having gone there uh, with their ideas from Central Europe. Uh, one could argue with this house uh, in this day and age to say, well, these glass areas are really excessively large for the kind of so uh, strong sun we have. Do you really need such enormous windows in, in, in a bedroom? One could answer, yes, uh, it would be still nice to have such big windows, but they should probably be more shaded. Uh, there should be more shade in, uh, in covering them. Um, but the freedom that is gained by utilizing uh, steel pipes to hold up uh, a building, uh, as much as uh, Corbusier used, used reinforced concrete uh, pipes, holding up a very rigid structural uh, frame of timber, uh, even using timber in a structural way so, so that it's, uh, it can produce a ramp that is free-spanning some 50 feet or 25 meters without any support, is e e e extracting the most that industry can contribute or technology can contribute to the uh, uh, to the imagery of, uh, of, uh, uh, of modern architecture. The hollow center of the house, even with even the vertical well attached to it, and this mural, which may be visually uh, somewhat to our eyes today, some 30-odd years later, uh, still speak very much the language of uh, this early modern architecture. Another way, uh, of course, the influence that these houses have had is the relationship between the kitchen and the dining room, which has become a much less formal affair than it had been in previous times. Uh, there are no servants, and there's no sense in having completely shut off um, uh, rooms separate for dining, uh, although most people still seem to prefer that. Uh, a, a, a less formal household will tend to have a dining room that's almost an adjunct of the kitchen, which makes it so much more convenient to serve meals to a family with, uh, with children. Now, to take the same theme of uh, utilizing uh, the separation of diverse elements in a house, the daytime and nighttime uses and other uses, and make almost separate wings of them. Here, although not all of it is showing, this is the, uh, the wing containing the bedrooms. This is the wing containing all the living areas. But they are separated, and they're at different levels due to the slope of the site, and they're connected by a ramp. And by separating them, we gain open areas that are wind-sheltered courtyards. There's one for living, there's one for the entrance. And here's a, a car park, which is separated from the house, really, a double carport. And it forms another third courtyard for service, where you hang the laundry so that you don't see it all the time. And this also is characteristic of that uh, mode of the early 50s. This house is built in about 1951 or two. Uh, and here you can see one wing on the right, another on the left, somewhat rem uh, vertically separated on uh, the contours. Uh, rare nowadays that we get such free, open uh, spaces as that, but one can sense immediately the transparency, the openness of the living area, well sun protected in this case, and the sheltered outdoor patio that uh, is created on the off-view side, so that from the living room you can use it, and that has many advantages. Uh, the disposition of this principle in different ways on the site is, is just endless in its potential variation. Um, here is one that is really also a binuclear plan, as it's been called. The two centers, the living area with its kitchen and the quiet uh, uh, nighttime use, but they are disposed on different floor levels. We see one higher and one lower, and the garage lower still, uh, so as to uh, make the thing more compact uh, and dispose it to suit the particular site conditions, within, which in this case are in, uh, in Canberra. But similarly, well protected large glass areas, the transparency that allows us virtually to look right through the house and see a recessed courtyard within the simple geometric form, we can see daylight through there, uh, to uh, give a, a, a desirable outdoor space, particularly suited to the needs of that site and family. Here on the exterior, clearly expressing the different floor levels as they uh, occur on that uh, uh, hillside and how they're placed on it. 
Sydney, of course, has very steep waterfront sites, and that uh, should have and has had an effect on uh, the kind of houses built there. And when the site is really steep, such as in this case, it is impossible to utilize effectively or economically traditional methods of construction, which still use the old wall, the brickwork, to hold up the, 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 the floors above. In this case, it's quite seen the house is uh, even disposed on three different levels, three floors. But you can see how uh, the slope of the ground is just so drastic and so radical that uh, a column holds up this front edge and uh, with the advantage that these terraces that open up as both sun protection and outdoor areas of outside all these rooms, um, the garage floats up uh, near the street side, also way up suspended in air by necessity. Um, uh, such uh, dramatic sites uh, simply require such dramatic solutions that will simply suspend most of the building mass in midair, uh, getting the maximum out of the view and by utilizing uh, uh, the essence of uh, modern structural uh, technology. In this case, almost an identical principle to the very first slide I showed of the uh, uh, skeleton building of Corbusier's. The advantage is that we get these uh, decks and terraces overlooking the view so we can enjoy the sun and sit on it or, 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 or take the view in which we become part of the interior. There are many such examples. Here's another one. Uh, using uh, two long decks, but you can see by the simple reg regular placing of these columns that it is based structurally on very much the same principle. By uh, trying to reduce the, uh, the needs uh, of that structure, in other words, to make it as thin, as economical as possible, uh, the loads imposed on it should be turned into stretching loads rather than vertically uh, hiding loads. And here we have uh, a shell that actually produces uh, a, a horizontal thrust into that top slab. This is the roof of the house, and thereby helps to diminish the load that come upon it. Uh, as we can see how drastic this, the slope is on that site, so that it needs this uh, colonnaded support. Rare that we see such things used in a simple, direct, easy to make way. The, com the elements of this are used as expedient devices but rarely with any uh, aesthetic consequence to them. In other instances, while we're talking about houses on the slope, which certainly affect the Sydney scene very much, uh, is a situation where it just isn't far enough away from the ground uh, for us to have to suspend everything in midair. And there, the utilization of brick walls may be entirely reasonable to just extend them a bit further down, but to create levels for floors that step down the hill together with the slope of the ground. Uh, and, and this can have uh, quite uh, produce sensible solutions, uh, especially on, on, on uh, normal subdivisions where it is quite uncertain what's going to happen next door. Sometimes it's somebody's garden, somebody's likely to build a house there. Well, obviously, you don't put windows into that side. You tend to keep it uh, opaque. Uh, and such sites, although they're getting to be rare to come by in this day and age uh, where everything's so very much built up in our uh, suburban areas, in the 19, uh, early 1960s when this was built, it was still a possibility to get waterfront sites and to make, again, every view, every room of this house face the view, uh, supported on simple masonry columns project out the, uh, the living area, the outdoor living area, as in this case, and protect each of the uh, glazed areas, which face, in this case, to the north, uh, with adequate shading devices that reduce the undue buildup of heat inside. I think the need to build for a view is ours as much as uh, other parts of the world where people also have magnificent settings to put houses. I show this one which is by Breuer, a fairly recent house built in the early 70s uh, that uh, is located on Lago Maggiore in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, and it follows very much a similar principle in that all the rooms really face the magnificent lake. It's built on a steep hillside it, uh, on a platform uh, that makes room for the house with open roof decks. But really, the, the, the opportunities that it offers for grandiose uh, 
views to be captured uh, for the interior of the house is surely compelling wherever such opportunities exist. Uh, anybody who's seen that lake, it's one of the most delightful spots on earth. But uh, our Sydney Harbour, or in, uh, the views in, in our capital, uh, other capital cities, uh, are also something thoroughly worthwhile uh, for architects to employ, uh, exploit. So here we have a simple reinforced concrete building uh, with columns, shaded verandas outside. This is a very early morning uh, picture showing the way the sun comes in early in the morning. It doesn't really do any harm, particularly in a house of such exquisite materials, such as having, uh, as this one is having um, uh, split uh, granite slabs on the floor. Very rare indeed, but uh, uh, a delightful setting for uh, a house. The slope of a site and the need to categorize and to compartmentalize the different uses is utilized in this house uh, of the early 70s um, in, uh, in the northern suburbs as much as in the other examples. With the additional element that the, uh, the thing is not quite as compact as all that, the upper part, which contains bedrooms, the upper zone, the upper nucleus, is separated from the lower one, which contains the living one. Where, and there's a third one below for dining and, and kitchen and so on. But they have between them an open gap, a space producing element. And also the element of a curve is introduced in the way of a fireplace as well as a bar unit or whatever uh, attached to the very rectilinear totality. And uh, the, the way in, in which floor levels are disposed is clearly expressed on the outside. The higher level on the right top are the bedrooms, the lower, uh, below it uh, are dining room, kitchen and so on. And with this curved apse end, almost like a, 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 a church's round element here, is the living area. And this clear separation makes not only uh, spatial and aesthetic sense, here we see the living room, and we look into this rounded uh, end that contains uh, a special element of the living room, and the, we see the fireplace. But the space-making gap is the new uh, element here exploited really in the way early modern architecture did. The, the, the cube that is pulled apart, the planes that are exploded in space to allow uh, continuous vistas between uh, the eye level here uh, and the, 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 the ceiling there and vice versa, looking down uh, and from that level up here into this medium level, into the lower level. These interactions are the, are the things that give uh, interest to uh, so much uh, 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 domestic architecture, which is otherwise rather character characterless in this country in the way it disposes of uh, the small, necessarily small spaces. Here is another example of how even four levels are fused together. It's in my own house uh, where uh, there's an upper level and one can see again the gap, how these trays, structural trays which contain floors are pulled apart and yet supported by a regular very much organized structural support system. Uh, the flamboyance comes out of the way this steep site solves its disposition of the different parts on half levels, which are connected by uh, a few uh, steps. So by making uh, the structure uh, uh, help us support such a house by not touching nature very much, by only isolated points of support, but we make space flow inside such a structure, in between the different levels and op give opportunities of different vistas between the spaces that are generated by these different uh, trays, as one might call them. And the result is, of course, not only one that fuses the house internally within itself, but also toward the outside. Uh, within, there's the constant views downward and upward from the different uh, floor levels. Here we look down into a playroom, up into a dining room. We can't really see them, but the artworks are enticing us uh, to, exp to walk up and experience something that is, is not fully uh, disclosed to you. Uh, in the way uh, houses, these houses are disposed on the landscape, tend to say uh, nature is sacrosanct, particularly when it is as beautiful as these uh, marvelous Sydney sandstone ledges 
it would be a great shame to demolish them, to harness them uh, and cover them up with some kind of uh, traditional architecture that uh, has so many walls hitting the ground. Here, isolated points of support come down and leave the, the ground, the nature untouched, flowing right under and in between the house. And even when we do put a, um, a swimming pool there, it also is partially suspended so as to let the rock ledges and nature go right up unto, uh, underneath here, uh, and, and, and so as to not um, hurt the natural environment any more than it must by necessity uh, be. Now let us turn to away from the design of the individual house and just look at the obvious social needs to bring into some kind of sensible focus the inevitable fact that houses are built next to each other. And people want privacy between. Uh, usually houses marching down the street simply have a little gap between each one. And I think this is a great shame because it serves no purpose at all. It is ugly. Uh, it, it very often robs a desirable outlook for a living room. And here is a, a simple essay of how, uh, by disposing buildings in a sort of checkerboard fashion, one further back, one further to the front, uh, maybe the road is even at an incline to them, as it is in this case, uh, it gives the opportunity of outlook for this house, where this is the desirable orientation to have a northern yard which enjoys part of the environment of this house here. And this one will do the same to its northern side. And uh, this one, where is a playroom, can use visually, at least, the neighbor's open space there rather than looking into a blank wall. There's a tremendous need for us to uh, either legislatively or preferably by simply design intent by architects to exploit uh, the siting of houses so as to maximize the opportunities and the experiences inside uh, such houses. Here is the view that one would have from the backyard of one house into the, uh, the, the glass wall of the one next door. Uh, whether one needs fences, I personally feel fences are a, a very asocial thing. One can do without them. At most, I would recommend having a hedge between. Uh, in America, people simply don't build fences. Screen wall, where you want to hide uh, or get privacy from the street, as this screen freestanding wall does, uh, to this open um, uh, backyard. But uh, with small sites, we gain a great deal of uh, spatial advantages and privacy advantages by planning in that way. Now, aside from this social aspect, the other social aspect really is one of production. And here's an early example of how I once tried to, in fact, build prefabricated houses. And everybody has this utopian notion that it should be possible to produce houses in a factory just as we do cars in order to bring their price down, in order to give people what is considered quite luxurious elements of sliding glass doors, uh, me mechanized bathrooms, mechanized kitchens, all at minimum cost because they're going to be made in series under industrial conditions. Uh, this house was put up as a show house in 1954 in the town hall in Sydney. And very little has come of that kind of way of going about it. The, the, the simple necessity is to have a guaranteed market of some 100,000 units or 50,000 units a year before it becomes economic to set up a production line to make at least the, the uh, element of such a house, which at that time sold for 250 pounds. In 1954, you could have the bulk, the essence of a house, $500. Uh, it seems a long way back. I suppose inflation has taken over. But nevertheless, it, it demonstrates the fact, even by those uh, times, it was remarkably inexpensive, uh, which, of course, comes from the fact that it is made in the factory, erected on site minimum time. Uh, but the elements that was concentrated on in the show house were to, to say, well, a kitchen. Everybody wants a kitchen, and it's not in need of being all that different to other kitchens. And if you could mass produce them, you would get so much better a product. Uh, the same goes for bathrooms. And here's the, uh, the bathroom uh, as envisaged as a prototype made in the factory, dropped as a single component total thing onto the building side. The thing that stops this from being reality is the fact that you'd have to have over 100,000 units to make every year. And people can never agree on, uh, uh, 100,000 people can't agree that they want that kind of bathroom, even if it were better and cheaper than any other. Uh, and the same goes for the mechanical heart of a kitchen. 
here in 1954, cooking tops, which have now become um, a standard practice, built-in refrigerators, uh, dishwashers, and so on, were all envisaged here in the servery leading to the, uh, to the dining room on the left. All these things uh, produced at quite minimal cost if one were to mass produce them. But this, uh, I'm afraid, is not uh, uh, probably to be. But let us now turn uh, uh, our attention to the really social, the big, big social problem, aside from making it possible for people either to afford a house or a ho afford a beautiful house. The fact is with us that our cities are getting enormously spread out. There is not as much land as there used to be to build on, and re use of land is now taking place. But the way it is taking place is most deplorable, in that uh, local government simply allows people to pull down a house, such as that one or that one, and on their sites, on their 50-foot blocks, build a block of flats. And just look at it, a great big long barrack-type building looking at its neighbor across a gap of no more than five meters, and that is no exaggeration to say, it is the shame of a nation and it is degenerate because we do not find these kind of standards as low as that uh, coming into force in other Western countries. It's again because we don't compare our notes sufficiently with other Western nations, such as European countries, uh, such as the United States, where such things just simply don't happen. Here it is, uh, we believe uh, in letting things take their natural course. Don't interfere with the way things move, and just let people see, uh, do as the marketplace very often determines. And the marketplace says people need houses closer to the city. So the local government takes no uh, action uh, to either resume land, replan land. Uh, they simply say, well, well, in this area, which will color red uh, in certain areas where the houses are old, we'll let you build flats. And this is the result. And it's just simply not good enough. I think architects of the new generation must find viable alternatives to these kind of uh, uh, results, which de absolutely denude all the property uh, of any trees. It's all covered with bitumen for cars. And uh, it's pretty horrifying to imagine a new generation growing up in habitat of this kind, where they look across uh, uh, this five meter gap and see somebody else's uh, bathroom or living room. Uh, you know, people compare this, uh, well, it's no worse in Europe, uh, it's uh, in some parts. Well, it's true, the slums of Naples have got gaps like that, but uh, I prefer the slums of Naples because at least they have some genuine charm about them, uh, whereas this is utterly devoid of any uh, visual uh, quality whatsoever. Now, what can be done? A lot can be done. And our history shows us that uh, in, the, in the 19th century, people went about building uh, housing for people closer together uh, uh, than we do today uh, very effectively. These terrace houses were considered slums for a long time, but now highly regarded as desirable places to live because they're close to the city and intelligent in that they use common dividing walls. Uh, they shield their windows, even moderate windows, from the sun by, the, by, by these uh, verandas. Uh, it's a sensible form of housing, and people have now, uh, of course, grown to um, accept this and uh, a lot of it is being built, but never on a large enough scale, or never on a totally planned in, uh, uh, enough scale. And that's where the real uh, need is. And to illustrate this, here is a, uh, a plan for Campbelltown, a new area, first of all, on the outskirts of the city, rather than just cutting up a potato field into, uh, uh, with a rezoning of uh, more housing land is needed, uh, farmland is simply chopped up into conventional suburbia. Well, this should be preceded by a very deliberate planning procedure uh, that should determine how big a community is to be. And here, assembly of five of them, each surrounded by, by a circumferential road, and clearly saying where medium density housing is to be, where normal housing of, say, 12 people per acre, which is normal suburban densities, 35 people per acre in medium density housing, and up to 100 people per acre uh, in high-rise buildings. If you predetermine where these things are going to go, each one will be far better than it would be if you just allow it to happen. But that seems to be against the Australian makeup to, to uh, uh, predetermine things. Rather, fumble through a situation 
uh, let it happen, and then worry about the consequences later. And this, I think, is wearing a bit thin when we look at the physical results all around us. Uh, here's a detail showing uh, this 12 people per acre suburbia, where everybody lives along a, a cul-de-sac street, and every child can walk to school, which is in that town, uh, neighborhood center, shopping, school, community hall, a reachable on foot without crossing any streets from every house, medium density housing in the same way, adjacent to the traffic route that goes around it, and so on. There is a great need for such planning. Uh, there are a few examples of medium density housing to show that the old terrace house idea, translated in our own terms, can be become an entirely acceptable mode of housing where there simply isn't enough land for people to have their own 50 feet block. Because what do they really want? They want privacy, they have it. They have their own front door, they have a private backyard, they have communal space which is safe for children to, to play in, which is better than they have uh, what they have now, because we have too many streets in our suburbs. And this is the kind of pattern that can result. Houses are joined, common walls, but they're entirely private with their own screened walls, courtyards, and the, and the communal uh, space outside them. These densities uh, uh, can work where we want something like 30 people per acre, three times, up to three times the normal density. Uh, but they must be pre-planned rather than allowing it to happen. Here's an example of it happening on quite a slo uh, uh, considerable sloping hillside. At least the units are disposed in such a way that it's made quite clear that everybody will have a clear outlook, that you don't block each other's view in the sighting of the houses. And that can only be predetermined by a three-dimensional control plan. Here, a model built to show the houses stepping up the hill, the sighting of the houses to, be, to bring more interest, uh, the groups of houses, rather, to bring interest into it by com having communal swimming pools, gaps between the units predetermined so that the public space and the private courtyard uh, are elements that are part and parcel of what uh, will finally uh, happen, rather than hoping for the best by restrictive rules, which is all that Australian planning seems to depend on. Forbid people to do certain things rather than uh, help them uh, do better by ha having things explained to them. Here's a courtyard in one of these houses, which I believe is a good thing to uh, uh, plan for in our climate better, really, than um, uh, uh, the old veranda. I think the Mediterranean uh, precedent uh, is too little exploited in our climate in creating these recessed patios for houses which are equally sheltered, but they are more wind uh, resistant, and they are simply wider uh, than the old veranda. And that harks back to the kind of living that happens, as in this case in Greece, for instance, a very similar climate, uh, age-old tradition have uh, come up with these outdoor living spaces uh, that are simply contained and uh, encircled by uh, patios. Now to come back to medium density housing, or how do we increase densities with simple planning uh, uh, formulae that will ensure better standards than the ones we have seen? The land simply must be amalgamated. Large areas of land must be brought under collective ownership and then re-subdivided to yield units that will benefit from this procedure. Here's one that shows four-story buildings, two-story buildings, but all arranged, joined together, but arranged in such a way that they have open outlook uh, in, in, in front of them, spaces outside them. They don't look across this inevitable gap of the non-planned development. Trees can be maintained, can be kept, and children can play. And we can close suburban streets to achieve this. There is no need to have so many street frontages where the houses are gone. And, there, and we do build medium density collective housing. It can gain by the land area occupied by streets. And here's a case in point of land having been amalgamated in Queensland. Uh, this used to be uh, individual blocks running at right angles to the street. And they've been brought together. The, 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 uh, the buildings have been turned around sideways. They've been staggered so as to avoid looking at each other. The next door street has been closed. 
and there's another lot beyond it faces the other way onto it, and we gain space for a swimming pool, for a tennis court, trees, and that is just so much better uh, a thing to do than to uh, not take any planning steps, as I'm afraid the Australian uh, norm is. Here's the, the, the traffic's kept to one side, shielded from the street, the cars are in the front of the building or under it, uh, but on the view side, on the desirable orientation side, there are screened courtyards again for the ground floor units. Others have balconies looking at the view or looking, overlooking uh, this central uh, uh, space. And here, uh, uh, the kind of space it is, private for the people below, giving them, uh, for instance, children, uh, small, uh, families with small children uh, having a safe area for them to uh, uh, run around and all the children having a communal space in which to uh, uh, to play and here we overlook in fact the communal swimming pool and the landscaped garden now this could be ours if only uh, local government were to take steps to uh, take an active part in the process uh, of building for these uh, higher densities up to 50 people per acre and uh, the inside of such units are fairly uh, standard and simple to plan uh, minimum dwellings, uh, but they certainly offer the opportunity of all the modern uh, devices that um, uh, are by now well known. Now when it comes to really building for greater densities than that, which is inevitable and necessary in some parts, we usually allow that to happen as a last resort. We change from old houses on the waterfront, suddenly pull them down and build a huge block of flats. The same thing applies. They usually have terrible outlooks, they are contorted because they don't fit properly. And here are examples of Le Corbusier's early houses, uh, early apartments of this kind, uh, show uh, how a freestanding building uh, gets just so much more uh, than could ever be the case with, a, um, with one that is an afterthought. Here in London, the London County Council has built such uh, housing with resulting vast open spaces, and yet the density here is something like 100 people per acre. Uh, you know, close to eight times as much as we uh, are able to get on land in normal suburbia or, or double as much as in medium density housing. Uh, the Scandinavian countries are in the forefront of this kind of procedure to plan for housing people at specific densities to save land. Tapiola outside of Helsinki is a case in point where every building was predetermined, every open space was pre-planned before there was any building. And the result is that buildings uh, are not as close together as all that. Uh, they maintain public areas between. The roads are in the right place so as not to offend uh, people or, or hurt uh, potentially children. Uh, and whatever the density is, it's high density, medium density such as this, or low density, uh, courtyard houses, uh, they all are uh, planned and built by in groups by different architects the totality is virtually utopian by our standard. What, are we, uh, what is our record in that regard? And we don't have much of a record, quite frankly. We have uh, the history in 1957. Uh, there is um, um, McMahon's Point, the peninsula on, on uh, uh, Sydney Harbour, uh, which was threatened to be uh, used for um, uh, waterfront industry. Uh, a terrible thought, and uh, a simple formula was laid down to say, look, on the waterfront you should only build low buildings near the water, medium height buildings on the slope, and high buildings at the top, so that as in the theater everybody can see the view. And what is the result looking at that model of 1957, and what's in the intervening 20 odd years, what's been the result? The very opposite. Land values are highest at the waterfront, so you get a great big tower built right on the water, blatantly blocking everybody behind it the best view of the world, some of the finest view of the harbor, occupied by a parking station and new three-story buildings on, on top of the hill. There seems to be no salvation until we wake up uh, to ourselves. Uh, uh, there are many instances where uh, just the sheer fact that uh, a front line exists that doesn't block anybody else, either a peninsula or a sheer cliff like that, it's reasonable to put a, uh, a building that looks at the view. But the type of architecture that should in, be involved here is to give the maximum benefit to the, to the inside uh, occupant. Again, 
and that is to make every flat look at the view, just as in those early Breuer houses. Every flat looks at, with its main views toward the, um, uh, the view. This uh, apartment house uh, uh, built in Mexico some years ago does that very same thing. Um, veranda giving shade to the uh, desirably large glass area. And here we see the, the external uh, um, uh, terrace even getting bigger where it should in front of the living room. Uh, but all the main rooms uh, facing uh, the, the, the desirable outlook. A, a peninsula I mentioned, well, you can't have everybody looking uh, all, all one way if, uh, if the land's very narrow, as in this tongue of land. So they are disposed on all sides, but disposed in such a way as to uh, really take advantage of all the opportunities of vistas by placing room, uh, the, the rooms alternately in the different uh, corners. Living rooms can look either uh, or any of the four uh, sides by the building being placed diagonally on the site. Here we see that disposition of alternate views to maximize the outlook as this particular location uh, seems to uh, uh, suggest. Occasionally on our harbor front sites it happens that only a very low density is permitted uh, on a medium slope, but just as in the houses uh, that adjust their levels to suit uh, what nature has given us, um, the same uh, can happen to multiple dwellings, where in this case the houses simply are placed above each other, or the flats are above each other, and they use outdoor spaces uh, above uh, the roof of one, forming the terrace of the one uh, uh, above, in order so that everyone can enjoy uh, what um, the uh, outlook has to offer us. Um, it does, of course, happen um, uh, that we get the need to build a multi-story building, a lot of apartments, uh, within a very restricted uh, building envelope. It can only be this wide and this high. And what do you do if there's an awful lot of people in that to be housed in that apartment building, uh, and yet uh, we don't have enough surface to look at the view. So there's 80 units, so we give each one uh, an 80th of the facade. That is the main, uh, there are small apartments, the living room looks that way. We simply haven't got space to put all the bedrooms looking that way. And that's what happens uh, in, uh, as we can see in section, uh, that we uh, find another place for it. And that can only be achieved effectively by splitting the levels, just in those other houses, which is where it's done for other reasons. An access uh, way where you go down to an apartment, it's got its view side window, or you go up to an apartment, it has its view side window. But to get to the bedroom, you go up another half flight, and you get the bedroom on the off side. Now, this simple planning trick is very little exploited uh, in, in Australia, uh, as uh, would be um, uh, the case even for larger apartments. Again, looking at the harbor, and everybody wants to see the water, and it makes common sense for them to, uh, to do so. And here, the split uh, of these apartments with bedrooms one side, living room on the other, uh, is really uh, quite evident from this, uh, from this end elevation. You can actually see the floor levels, how they're uh, juxtaposed here. To sum up, I think what should have become evident from these illustrations is that we have a long way to go to close the gap between what is actually built and these prototypes, these examples of modern architecture that are based on well-established precedent. That is a great need. But probably a greater need still is that of coming to terms with the totality of housing, which if allowed to proceed on the ad hoc basis in which it takes place now, leads to chaos. And that is a political as well as a social question, which is a very difficult one to resolve, but it remains for architects to take the lead to do so.